Okay, there. Okay, welcome back to another Teaching Tuesday. And today is absolutely um, going to be amazing because this is my precious mentor, Linda Runyon's son, Eric Conover. And he is the one who is responsible for keeping her legacy alive and for all of the amazing books that she has written, that she lived. How do I get that there? There it is. Can That's you a well-thumbed it? copy. <laughs> <laughs> I have it practically memorized. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm just so thrilled, Eric, to to see you here in person, and I'm grateful for the time we've spent together in the past, um, and the way in which you've been so supportive of me with Wild Blessings, and um, welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what we're going to be covering today. Well, thanks for having me, Holly. I really appreciate it. About me, uh, well, I'm kind of all over the map. I do a lot of different things. I uh, was a professional magician for many years, many years. I did theme parks and we'd start off, well, I'd do about 500 shows a year. What? In, between May and September, but mind you. Like, wow. yeah, I would do five a day, whether I needed them or not. And uh, <laughs> do you have any of these on YouTube? Uh, there are a couple videos on YouTube that are there. Yeah, search Eric Conover Magician. Uh, there's one group called CampConstitution.net. I'm actually their webmaster as well, so I, I gave away. I also do that. Um, and uh, yeah, one one whole show of about an hour, maybe a little mm -hmm. more, is online. Uh, they put it up. So great, check it wow. out. Does it have the the trick where the bird comes out of your mouth? Why, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Oh, good. That That's a signature trick. I mean, I haven't invented that many tricks, so it's got to be an every show. You invented that one. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I saw Avner the Eccentric off-Broadway. He's a, a pretty, he, he's a well-known clown in the clowning world. And uh, he did this trick where he's eating tissues as dinner. And next thing you know, out comes a bouquet of flowers. I thought, oh, wow, that really looks good. I could probably do that with a bird. So I did. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can hear feedback. Am I doing something wrong? I don't know. Okay, well, we'll edit that out. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I definitely, if you could send us the link to that, I'll put it in, in our um, comments. Oh, okay. Um, uh, also, let, me, let me start some notes here so that I don't forget. Okay. Okay, well, let me, before you do that, I want to say this. Um, her books, I have hundreds of foraging books, but um, Linda's books are my favorite, Eric. And the reason why they are is because she lived this. You know, she wasn't just like a Holly Drake that, you know, I just go out and do it for fun. This was her life. And this is how they not just survived, but thrived in the wilderness for 13 years. And so I think that um, learning from someone like that is incredible and then to have been her son what an amazing privilege that must have been and we just kind of want to hear a little bit about what that was like and and whatever you want to share and then also i gave you questions that mm -hmm. our uh, group has asked me to ask you so um you're welcome to address those at any point as well so, okay anyway well, great. And his website is called ofthefield.com, and you'll be talking in detail about that, and we'll put the link and all that, because you guys need to get his materials. They're amazing. Okay. Yeah, we'll get into all that. Uh, the, the shameless plug portion of our show. Amen. <laughs> well, okay, so what was the first question, though? I'm not used to being <laughs> well, I, want, I want you to start with uh, some of the background and, and tell a little bit about who your mom is and what it was like being her son. Yeah. And um, mom, I've got lots of questions. But... Mom was ec eclectic, to, sh to be sure. Uh, you know, she was very much an artist. Uh, she did lots of visual arts over the years. Um, oil paintings, for instance, she did a lot of that when I was a child. Uh, she continued to do pencil and charcoal drawings. And of course, all the materials are littered oh, yeah. with, with her art. Yeah. Um, she was a registered nurse. And uh, at one point, she moved with my younger brother, by the way, was autistic. So she moved with my younger brother and her uh, new boyfriend, and then shortly thereafter, husband at the time, uh, to the woods. And her idea was that the woods would be therapeutic to my brother. 
uh, she was right because my brother is uh, a professor at Syracuse University and uh, produces so much jewelry, so much jewelry. Todd yeah. Conover, just go ahead and search Todd Conover jewelry or Todd Conover metalwork and you'll see his stuff. He's got an Instagram feed. It's it's new stuff every day. It's amazing. So yeah. needless to say, he's brilliant and and grew out of that. Um, and and the woods are responsible. Uh, so. You know, I was young when I first went to the woods. I, I would say I was about 12, 13. And uh, they had a cabin on Louis Lake. Uh, Louis Lake is, Louis, um, Indian Lake is kind of a long lake, right? It's very, it's literally very long. But at the toe, sort of like Sicily is at the toe of the boot for Italy, it, at the toe of that lake was another lake called Louis Lake. And uh, they, rented a unwinterized cabin <laughs> on that lake and it was cold yeah. they moved there in the winter and mom tells the story about jumping in in a boat that they had uh it was a rowboat but it was an aluminum rowboat and they rowed down the hills and that's what she says she they bobsledded their stuff in and, and they did they got they lost control of it and there was always this little dent in the front of the boat boat where it had hit a tree but uh i thought it just gave it character <laughs> so that summer that I visited them the first time uh, was amazing. We we were allowed to just go out on the lake, row that boat anywhere in Louis Lake. You couldn't get lost. Well, actually, we could have got lost. They said, don't go in Miami. Miami was a swamp. They just, I think they always called it Miami too, not just my folks. But uh, it was a swamp and you could get seriously lost in there. They, uh, Mom actually has stories about that in uh, Homestead Memories one of her books this one right here oh that one right there that's the one Love yeah. this it's a great book i was just reading it as if i never knew it uh, she writes so well she does write well and uh we always helped her out a little with that too you know if something was like what do you mean here we do it and it's a good thing we did because uh i'm not saying it was bad but uh I, i'm digressing I, I i won't go out of order so she was she got in, in into Louis Lake, and I visited her there. And uh, I remember visiting quite a long time uh, that summer. It was a couple, three weeks. And uh, we were able to park this boat and go out onto the water whenever we wanted. And, and I got hit by this kind of dawning of what it's like to be with nature. The, this, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, it, the color green featured in my new vision of the world. And uh, it was it was great. I, I was just like, this is something else. It was a whole new world. And little did I know just how deep that whole new world would go. They were pretty civilized at that point. Um, you know, they feed the pot belly stove wood and lots of it because it was cold. But she has stories about her hair freezing to the wall because oh, yeah. if you slept against the wall. Well, you know, the, the moisture from your breath would freeze and your hair would freeze to that. And mm -hmm. you'd have to cut yourself loose from the wall and that sort of thing. Um, and, and the I, icicles would be, I was amazed at how they would collect icicles to melt them in buckets. And they yeah. would be like four to six feet long and 12 inches wide. And yeah. that's how big the icicles would be. <laughs> that, that was that was a very convenient water catchment system. They yeah. take one of those icicles and they put it into the old bucket. And it, I, I taught them, I came up with the idea. To take that bucket, the, the wood stove, right, had a circle with the lid. You take the lid off, you put the bucket right down into the into the hole. So long as there's water in there, you could boil water or heat your water for washing your hair or or melt mm -hmm. icicles. And that's one of the things they did. Wow. Uh, after, you know, I, I, had, I had a little influence in how things came out here and there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it saved many trips to the water hole and, and hauling water. That, those were water hauling days. And Ken did all that. Ken was my mother's uh, husband, and he yeah. was a strong guy. Hauling water yeah. gets stronger, too, let me tell you. Yeah. I tried a little of that, and only a little, because <laughs> yikes. Uh, nowadays, even after all that experience, I go to a tap, I turn it on, and hot water comes out. I mean, I'm like, wow, this is great. We should yeah. keep this part in, you know. You, know, so, you never take it for granted. I, I don't. I think yeah. a lot of people do, and there are times when I do take it for granted. But yeah. I remember when it was not so easy. 
running right. So you you really were blessed to be her son. How do you think um, that impacted who you are now? Oh, you know, this civilization, this city folk stuff, even like phones. Yeah, I have a phone. It's Android. I know how to use it. But all that. <laughs> And that reminds me, I should probably turn it off. Um, all that stuff is added on top of what it is to be a person living on the earth. You know, and and it's not something... I, I never forget that green dream stuff that happened back in the day with mom. And I certainly can't even walk down the road here in Boston and not see five or 10 wild foods in any given walk of, of a block or longer. They're there. The mm -hmm. foods are there. They're everywhere. Yeah. So his mom would always say, uh, look down, you're walking on your food. <laughs> she'd see these uh, pictures of, of the starving children in Africa and she'd be yeah. looking in the green corners and sure yeah. enough, there was food there, but they're starving. Yeah. It's just, she goes, this makes no sense. We have to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> so you picked up her passion. Well, yeah. I mean, it's contagious. Ma anything mom was into was contagious. She was <laughs> the most enthusiastic person I've ever met. Yeah. Uh, she was the most generous person I've ever met. And mm -hmm. uh, she was a survivor, too. She'd been through a lot. You, mm -hmm. you don't come out of the woods and not have a story or two. And mm -hmm. she has tons of them. Tons of them. <laughs> but it's it's really changes your character and, and gets you to look at this civilization in, in a really different way. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if God forbid something should happen and the food sources dried up and people were all in a panic as to mm -hmm. well, what am I going to eat? What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really wouldn't worry about it so long as it was summer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, mom had the secrets of how to store all that stuff too. Mm -hmm. uh, she had jars, so many jars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, had to, I had to move them once. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> well, one of the one of the books you guys need to purchase is called "Eat the Trees," and that was birthed because of a tragedy. They had a refrigerator, which was basically a hole that it was dug what nine feet deep in the ground, mm -hmm. where they would keep all of her stored, um, pro preserved, canned. Um, wild foods that she had canned over a, a campfire. So you can imagine what kind of work that represented. And she had 420 uh, jars of this preserved canned food that exploded. Why did it explode, Eric? Do you remember? Well, water on this planet expands when you freeze it. It doesn't yeah. contract like most things do when you get them cold. So uh, anything that had water in it would expand to the point where it would either push the top up or break the jar mm -hmm. and and sometimes both um there were a few that she was able to rescue from that incident she talks about it uh live on the dvd too mm -hmm. that was one of the uh stories she got on there that's true so you yeah. guys can get the dvd i really recommend the book though because what happened as a result is she's literally down in the hole, surrounded by all this broken glass and all of this food that she had so lovingly preserved. And she's going like, how am I gonna feed my family? And she looked up and there she could see the trees up above and remembered the um, Algonquin uh, Indians were called um, bark eaters. Bark eaters, yep. That they had actually um, survived by eating the trees throughout the winter, the Candia la layer. And so she wrote an entire book on all the different trees they ate that winter. And I, I suppose they lived, huh? Uh, they did actually live, yes. <laughs> she was trying the whole dig up wild food thing in that, that winter too. Uh, if you know where wild food is growing, you can dig down to it and harvest it and eat it that way because it'll yeah. either be dried or frozen, probably dried, then frozen, freeze dried. I don't but know. the snow <laughs> in the Adirondacks sometimes would be like you could you could have a whole foot drop within an hour of snow and the temperatures would be so cold below zero and it just sounded brutal. It, Can you it, tell it, us the story about when you went to visit her in the wintertime and um, <laughs> and the fireworks that preceded? <laughs> well, I think I had a few sticks of fire, fireworks, as I recall, but I never had very much because 
what kid has that kind of money? And and besides, they were illegal, illegal in the state that I lived in. But I, I got a hold of a few and brought them along. And then I decided, well, let's make some more visuals. So I started playing with gasoline. Don't recommend this, kids. Don't try this at home. But uh, this is a whole other generation, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a tube, like a clear plastic tube. You could see gasoline. I put a little loop of gasoline in the uh, in the bottom of this tube. And I'd have a candle lit there. And I go, <laughs> and it would shoot the gas at the candle and, of course, catch fire and make giant fireballs. Uh, you know, I think <laughs> she was trying to disguise the fact that it was a lot of gasoline and not just fireworks. So, and so fireworks and would have been safer, you, too. But that was kind of a precursor to what you ended up doing. Tell us what you did That's with right. fire later. Well, much later. Uh, the year was 1994. And the uh, Great Escape in upstate New York, which is the biggest theme park there. I was I was the magician. That's one of those uh, theme parks where I, I did 500 shows a season. You start from a week before Memorial Day. You do five a day right through to a week after Labor Day. It'd drive you crazy if you didn't really love it. But um, I they, they had a new roller coaster. This roller coaster came from another theme park that was disbanded, and they took it piece by piece and reassembled it there on the grounds. It was called the Comet, right? And they were having, they were doing these uh, advertisements, and I ended up learning to blow the fireball out the mouth, and they were going to use that in the commercial. And uh, so I, I got good at taking white gas. Don't try this at home, kids. I'm giving you the formula. A lot of people use kerosene, but I use the white gas. Much better, Bull. Anyway, um, you blow that at the open flame. And I, I never knew while I was practicing. Thank God I didn't know because I probably wouldn't, wouldn't have done it at all. That flame will come all the way back to your mouth, like to right about here. And I was a bearded guy then. I, this is still my magic beard. Well, a little grayer, but... Um, yeah, so it was uh, a little dangerous, but I, I did it for years. And then my, my girlfriend, Rosary, who worked on a, a lot of these books, uh, she got me off of that because it caused cancer in the state of California. But I, And I'm like, well, we're in Massachusetts. <laughs> anyway, I, I know the difference. But I, know, I, know. I know your mom was certainly proud of, of, of you and all of your amazing adventures. And, it's, and she was so grateful, too, for the way you've supported her. All right, so tell us something scary that happened on the homestead. Anything that you remember that was frightening? Scary? Well, some of the mountain climbings could be slightly scary. There was one mountain we all climbed one day, which was a chimney mountain. It was across uh, Indian Lake from things. And it's it rocky. And you could walk up it, but there are areas where you get a chimney. Now, a, a, a chimney is not what we think of as a chimney to, for the smoke to go up. It, a chimney is something where you have two sheer rock faces. And you can put your feet on one and your back on the other. And you can, like, go up it. It's a method of climbing Yeah. Uh, to go up a chimney. Well, we, we didn't actually do that or anything, but, you know, we played around on top of a lot of boulders. And years later, I brought my own kids there, and I have a whole series of pictures that I took at no. Chimney Mountain. And no. uh, So that was a little slightly dangerous. Uh, going down in the well after the bucket that I was responsible for How dropping. deep was that well? Was it? How deep was the well? It was down there. I would say it was 20 feet deep. You know, and you were like 12 years old climbing down in this old well. <laughs> I may have been. Uh, that was a, another homestead. I may have been 15. Okay. No, my mom says does say in the book 12, but I don't mm. think it was 12. Okay. <laughs> she, she's very generous with uh, my ingenuity and that sort of thing. But uh, I really did go down it. The, the, the bucket had to be retrieved. It was going to rust, mm -hmm. and it was going to foul the neighbor's water. And it was a real working well. Mm -hmm. it, it was true. It was their bucket that fell off the thing, the crank. But I was responsible for making that happen. So I I did get a bunch of parachute cord that I had with me and uh, figured out a way to lower myself down. And it, I was sort of chimneying down mm -hmm. the uh, well as well because you know it wasn't so awfully wide. But I got down there, got the bucket. They tied it to another rope, hauled that out, and then assisted me in in getting me out and. Uh, Apparently, it was a nail-biter for mom, but for me, it wasn't that big a deal. Well, you know, us mothers, 
Um, yes. Okay, there's one story in the Homestead Memories. And by the way, guys, I really recommend reading this book as a read aloud to your children because yeah, uh, one of the reasons why I'm so excited to have Eric on here and telling his stories is you want to make sure your kids have their own stories like you had when you were a kid. You want to have hiking habits and you want to have sit spots and forts and places where you can go and just be alone with God and, and forage and, and just have adventures and meet snakes like pudgy and um and have all of these incredible adventures but um so these are her stories and and they're so fascinating to read and as you're reading them you'll think you know what my kids don't have any camping experiences let's go camping or whatever like just get outside and um enjoy it but i wanted to ask you the story and i don't know exactly where it is in here but it was terrifying she and todd and i'm sure you've heard about it well you <laughs> you made this book so Remember the time when this wall of water, it's right after she talked about the beavers, 15 feet of water was coming through the woods, knocking over trees like they were toothpicks. And she and Todd were out there and it's coming right at them. And the beavers are surfing on top of this water, this wave of water. What on earth happened? I, I guess someone broke the, the beaver dam. And oh. the beaver dam was uh, backed up with water. A beaver, beaver dam will actually dam water. Oh, I know. And if, wow, if you bust, that's what happened. Yeah, yeah. So okay. If you, if you bust the beaver dam, beavers go surfing, body surfing. I guess I love her drawing for that. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. It's just amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I wasn't there for that one. But, okay, but um, you heard all about all these things. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, sure. it's tsunami in the woods in the North Country. You don't expect that. No. But uh, yeah. It, it's funny. She came across beaver back in in the Miami swamp too, on off of Louis Lake, and uh, you know you you'd have to find another way around because that was no longer a travelable waterway. So you'd have to. And she said they always found a way around. Yeah. So, so yeah, they they go cattailing and uh, you know the swamps. Supermarket of the swamp said mom about the cattails. Oh, every time I take people to the cattail swamp where I live, yeah. I take her book with me and I read her, um, you know, the part where she talks to the cattails and thanks them for all the gifts and all the seasons. Yeah. Remember that part? And I always read that and it's always makes me almost tear up because she mm -hmm. has such gratitude to the creator and to nature for the abundance that's all there to be gathered. And um, and I just love the way she writes about it. So I always read that in this book. That's wonderful, Holly. Thanks. Uh, she was great friends with many different Native American people. Yes. Um, great friends. I'm getting a little choked up because the day that mom died, I came back home to my sister's house. And I looked up and I couldn't believe it. There were seven bald eagles circling around. So, um, and I just knew that she had something to do with it. I mean, it was just, you know, that that's a mom thing. So there they are. And and that night there was a full moon came up off of the uh, horizon that I also felt mom had a lot to do with. It was yeah. just amazing. She, she was so close to nature, but I, I wouldn't have been close at all if it weren't for her. And oh, uh, that's what well, my heart. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, she... I, I, I'll put it this way. She found herself alone and unencumbered by a uh, a broken body by that point. She was sort of hunchback and, you know, she had mm -hmm. knee problems and neck problems. And, you know, and yeah. that's why that's why we never made the second DVD. There was going to be a second DVD. It was a, it was the how to version. I got to say something, though. <laughs> when when I went to visit her in the um, retirement center. Yep. She had in the window, guys, she had wild food seeds growing in the window. Like she would take her favorite wild edibles and have them growing in the window. And then she had a little scooter that she'd get around in. And yep. so she, I would follow her in the scooter and we'd go down into the courtyard. And in the courtyard, she had made a plant walk just like this one in the book <laughs> called plant identification walks and she had made one so that she could keep teaching the old folks in the in this place i mean like she was so young in spirit 
And she also had a craft class, all these nature crafts. And she showed yeah. me the craft room where she had all of these crafts that she had collected from nature so that the um, old folks could come in and she could teach them how to make stuff. And she gave me a lot of the things that she created. I mean, what a giving, generous person. She even gave me her um, her beautiful um, tea kettle from the homestead days, and um, which I just treasure. So I, I love the way, oh, and then in the hallway, there was on the computer was a camera of an eagle's nest um, that was showing the eagle moment cam. by moment, an eagle cam showing moment by moment what was happening in the, with the eggs. And when they would be hatching, she would uh, email me and say, Holly, they're hatching, you know, and it was just so exciting. So even though she wasn't outside like she wanted to be, she brought it in to her. And um, so I brought her a wild food feast and we ate that for lunch and she's eating the plantain and we're garbling the plants. And it was such a precious time, but it just was so bizarre for me to see her in a situation like that when where she really wanted to be and where she, her heart was and her spirit was, was in the wild. And so, um, but she can take us all there and her materials do a phenomenal job at that. She's literally transformed. How many thousands of people's lives do you think she's impacted, Eric? At this point, it's really hard to tell because these books have legs. They get out there. Some some will get in a library. I, I come across them here, there, and everywhere. I mean, someone scanned a whole the field guide, the uh, Essential Wild Food Survival Guide. I named that. Um, That's a good name. Got, I, well, it was named for the audience, the people who are embracing and buying her materials more than, you know. Um, and uh, certainly the original version, do you have something there? The original version of the book was called From Crabgrass Muffins to Pine Needle Tea. I have that. Yeah. And uh, it was to be subtitled, A Complete Compendium of Blah, Blah, Blah. Anyway, she did that with Random House. And uh, she went through five New York auditors, or editors, not auditors, uh, before they said, you know, we can't really work with you anymore. Keep the retainer, but bye. And that's where I, I said, well, this this work has come too far. We have to start to publish. And mom, I heard of this thing called print on demand. You make only as many books as you need. You don't have to make 20,000 and try to sell them or, or whatever. And I got, uh, I, I got her going and we prepared that book together. And I got being her son, I could say, Ma, what are you talking about? You were looking over the lake and you were seeing an arc waves. Arc waves? Really? What? No one knows what that means except you. You know, I, I would have that argument and and just get it back to something everyone would. I, I don't know. Maybe folks out there see an arc waves. I, I don't know. But I didn't think so at the time. So we got that book in publishing shape and, and then she came up with a uh, private publisher in Pomeroy, Washington for this. And she had the, uh, the, the cover done. I have the original artwork for the cover in the other room and uh, the, they, they published, but it wasn't very popular. And later I had the idea. It's the wrong audience, a coffee table book. It's, I'm sure you would love the coffee table book. I mean, and, and a lot of folks would, but other people are more, survival oriented you mm -hmm. know like this the whole the whole prepper movement has mm -hmm. uh all adopted her stuff because they consider it the best it for is. purpose yeah you know, that's that's where the, these wild cards came in the wild cards is sort yeah, of tell like, us about that oh yeah so it's this this she she per, uh produced this with the one investor that she had uh, a man by the name of larry acres if you're watching larry hi Thank you for getting mom going on these. And and these are still produced today through the uh, U.S. Games Company. It's a company that makes uh, tarot cards primar primarily. But they're printed currently in Italy. And uh, they're hard to get, even for us, because um, people nowadays have started to really... They're, they're selling out. They... they ordered a second load of these before the last load sold out. And the last load sold out the first day. Everyone oh, had my them. gosh. So yeah. these aren't made it of the field? You guys don't make these? No, they're made uh, They're made in Italy and sold through U.S. Games. And uh, it, it's a commercial product, and it's trademarked. 
there's a cooperation between Larry Akers, Linda Runyon, and the U.S. Games Company. But and, you sell uh, them at ofthefield.com, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We sell ofthefield.com. Write that down. Uh, o F T A T. I'll be putting that on there. Yeah. It's I. I hear it's a biblical reference. I. I never found those three words in a row in the actual Bible since I've come across a searchable version. Uh, but maybe it was a different version of the Bible. Anyway, that's what we called it. Okay. And um, yeah, you can get these there. We we have a stock of them, only about 50 at this point. And, and we're, we're hoping to get 25 more. One of Linda's students, um, a man by the name of Steve Brill or... or Yes. Known as Wild Man Steve Brill yeah, in, New York, yeah. in New York City, takes people out on uh, walks in Central Park. Mm -hmm. And these cards are one of the things he sells. He has an app yeah. too. And, yeah. uh, but we get an order from anywhere from 100 to 250 once every few. I think the last order is like two years before the pandemic. We haven't heard from him, but we just heard, heard from him. Steve, if you're watching, thanks for the order. Right. We don't even know quite how many he's getting, but um, <laughs> yeah, we're working that out. But uh, I, I, anyway, this was made then. Okay. For that, and it, it's it's been an ever popular product. It's just now. Why popular. why did I think that she made them for the Navy SEALs? Well, because the use of this or the conceived notion that people have is, I take this, I throw it in my bug out of town bag or get mm -hmm. out of Dodge bag, you know, the bug out bag. And uh, I'll have everything I need to eat wild food. I'll just look it up and I'll see what I can eat and I'll be safe. And play that, cards while I'm at it. And play cards after dinner. Yeah. But in actual fact, it takes a little more to learn wild food, as you know, and probably most of your listeners. Yeah. You have to, you know, you start with one plant. Yeah. You go to another plant. You just add more plants to your lexicon. Mom's doesn't even try to show all the plants. She shows about 50 or 52, mm -hmm. 52 cards in a deck. And uh, she's limited it to that because you can learn everything you need to know about eating wild food and the preparation techniques yeah. and the harvesting, all the techniques. And, and she limited cool. the number of plants that she was teaching so that she could teach more core stuff, like the how-tos and Yes. How to preserve. How to preserve stuff is really interesting. That's yeah. why all those jars, because mm -hmm. you have to have the dried food for the winter. And what was it like? What was it like in the homestead? With the, did she have wreaths hanging everywhere of dried teas? And can you kind of take us there a little bit and just kind of go back and and help us picture it in our minds? Well, yeah. I mean, she 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 make a wreath out of stuff. She she got more formal with wreath making because that became sort of a crafting class for her for her wild foodies too to do and she'd hang these up around she would put like sticks that she found sticks you know piece logs pieces of wood sort of driftwoody and she'd make these various frames around the uh i'm looking up because i can see it, um ar around the wood stove right and she heated with wood heat even after she left the woods mm -hmm. and she put these wreaths and bunches of, of stuff and it, they they dry out eventually over that mm. uh of course there's another technique where you use the oven and you just you get them bone dry she says that on the uh dvd mm -hmm. bone dry it has to be perfectly dry otherwise you get mold and then she put them into mm. the jars and because of the dryness thereof it, it would last but mm. uh it was it was very weedy everywhere you look and she I uh, it, was beautiful. it did it did um me practical i'm like aren't these gathering dust mom <laughs> but uh you know you wash that off sure uh she would have the drying racks in a window she'd create these drying racks that you would a tray and we have plans uh how to how to build a drying rack mom's way i drew it up on sort of a cad type program and you know, wood frames and slats, and then the dry the 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 actual tray goes in there, and you put screen on the bottom, wood mm -hmm. frame, and then you put screening on the bottom so air could flow through, and you put them in a window, hopefully one with sun, and uh, that would dry. So there were those too. 
Well, amazing. all of that stuff is illustrated with her artwork in in this book, which is, in a, I think of all of my, all of the books I have, and I've had a few, this is my absolute favorite foraging book. Um, but as far as the stories, I love the Homestead Memories. Yeah. Yeah, Mom's book is, one of, one of the downsides, I'm grabbing something here. Um, one of the downsides of print on demand is you got to pick do you want color or black and white and it's there's no doing a bunch of black and white on on the innards mm -hmm. and then putting just a little bit of color stuff in you'll see that the uh the actual identification section is also in black and white mm -hmm. so we didn't like that over time and we put together this which is a full this is the glorious color process yeah the full book of the uh identification photographs a lot of which were newly done yeah uh, by yours truly beautiful and we put that together so that you know really this should be inside this and down I agree. Here, but you can't I agree. really do it so all right, so let's go. Let's ask, answer some of the questions that my students have given you. Um, one of them is, "What is your favorite uh, food to forage for? Which, what was your favorite meals that she made for you? What was it like um, eating wild foraged food?" Well, in the beginning, Mom didn't tell us we were eating wild <laughs> foraged food. She'd sneak it in there. We'd have a vegetable soup, and there were <laughs> vegetables in it. Yeah, but there was other stuff. She'd sneak it in there, and uh, the thing that gave her away is she didn't like to spend too much time with the thyme, pulling the little leaves off of the sticks, and she'd get a little, you know, impatient with that. So she just throw them in. And I'm like, Mom, I'm a kid at that point. Like, Mom, I, there's sticks in the soup. What are you doing with sticks in the soup? And uh, you know, she has, oh, you can eat them. And yeah, you could. But I'd be like, Mom, my mother, putting sticks in the seat. What the heck? Uh, but she was sneaking stuff in. She put stuff, extra protein fillers in in the hamburgers. I, I ate red meat in those days. In the, in the hamburgers that she would serve us. They're, it'd be in there. You you wouldn't really know much about it. But so what do you know, call that? Tell us what you call that. I call that uh, ninja wild food cooking. <laughs> she, yes. <laughs> she, yeah. I mean... I, Maybe I learned the art of deception from my mother. I don't know. <laughs> don't think so. But uh, it's she. She put it in there. She, and let's face it, kids want to be normal. They don't. They don't want anything weird. Oh, we're different from other people. And and kids, you know, want that. Later, I learned to appreciate that. And uh, you know, I I took a walk. I remember I took this book, and I have the original. This is the book from the days that we're talking about put some clear plastic over you'll notice the price is 2.95 when oh, would you get this book from yule gibbons for only 2.95 that was back in the day that's that's right so i i was reading this stuff and i uh for instance looked at the um <laughs> the milkweed section and i took a walk myself when i was doing i built all this camping gear I would. I learned to sew just so I could sew uh, backpacks and goose down jackets and sleeping bags and backpacks and that sort of thing. And uh, there, there was a wonderful company called Frostline Kits, and I, I, everything I know, I, I learned from that those kits how to sew. It's respectable. Anyway, uh, I was going down the road with my pack on it, and I think I was coming back actually from an overnight camp, and I saw a big giant stand of milkweed. Now. It was on the road, yes, but it was a dirt road. Sure. So you could rinse that stuff off, and there was not a lot of traffic at all. Uh, so I got a whole mess of these, uh, the milkweed flowers, which the are bud? delicious. The, the buds. flower buds, yeah. Yeah. They're like broccoli. Yeah, I was, I was able to harvest enough for all of us to eat in like five minutes. And I left plenty, too. So mm -hmm. that would they'd have the pods later and. Okay. Yeah, and, and I brought those home and said, Mom's like, oh, good. She knew exactly what to do with them. But I thought I was actually teaching Mom about, hey, you know, you can eat some wild food. Because they were in those days, they were uh, growing a big, big garden. But um, they'd stopped making it so big and started foraging more. This was the first real homestead outside of Louis Lake. It was uh, 
it was an old old farmhouse and uh they shared it as caretakers with uh well a whole bunch of bats there were bats in the belfry bats in the attic and uh they come out at night and we watch them come out and you know we didn't go where they were and they didn't come where we were for the most part and uh we got along with bats but they were good they they eat bat black flies we like that oh i bet you hated the black flies horrible that was over most most of the time that would, i mean there's always some but the big black fly season where it's a black swarm around your head and you're breathing them in and that was you know that's early in the spring that first hatch is murder mm -hmm. did you uh, smudge your face with mud I never went that far, but we'd certainly use the bug spray if we went on a walk. The things that I didn't like were the deer flies. The, they're little no, flies. They, they, they would bite yeah. you. They go, yeah, yeah, they're circling your head. And at some mm -hmm. point, you're just, they'll drive you nuts. Yeah. So I hated the deer flies. You don't know whether you're about to get bit and get all yeah. nervous and jerky. Uh, I digress. Well, I'm, I'm trying to answer a question here. What was it? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, and, uh, uh, milkweed. That was one of my first big wild meals. Well, is that your favorite wild plant? No. My favorite was uh, sheep sorrel. Oh, yeah. Sheep sorrel. Later, I did, uh, I was being an extra in a movie called uh, The Surrogates with Bruce Willis in it. Okay. And it was on this old mental health facility near here in Boston. And uh, the fields grew up with biggest leaves of sheep sorrel you wouldn't believe it it was as far as the eye could see i'm like oh wow. man, that, you got to be careful you can't just chat out on handfuls of it because you're I gonna know. get the oxalic acid and right that's bad. but i i would love you know picking it and eating the lemony leaves mm -hmm. of that and um yeah that's good stuff wow. and then then i learned to like the wood sorrel too which tastes the same pretty much but more, <laughs> more like a shenrock Shamrock. Okay, so if you could ask who you are now, Eric, mm -hmm. if you could go back and rewind and be a kid again on the homestead with your family, um, what would be different? I'd be there. Uh, I mean, this is this is the thing. As a city kid coming in, I'm like, okay, I'm a city kid, and there's all this wilderness and things to do you know i could shoot a bb gun or i could shoot the 22 or i could climb the mountain in the backyard or this that and the other thing canoe you know? and then canoe and yeah all that rowboat stuff and and help when i when i was needed i mean later on the last homestead i helped dig out a, a, a basically not really a cistern because it was a it was a spring and they ken had put plastic pipe all the way down to the homestead from there one piece and it was just laying on the ground it wasn't really buried in so we keep that running all winter so that it didn't freeze up but i helped dig out that original that original well that was it was cold even in the middle of the summer of course because mm -hmm. it's coming from the mountain in the backyard you know yeah. uh i do all that stuff but to answer your question I mean, I guess I, I really was there and I paid attention to my surroundings when I was there and I appreciate hot running water nowadays just because it's there. And electricity, <laughs> you can turn on yeah. things like computers and, ooh, but didn't have any of that, none of that. And, 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 but being with the land and being observant of the land and watching a fire at night, yeah. you know, these and are the things, the, the smells of the, of the fire. We have a neighbor here in Boston that lights fires regularly and takes me right back. I mean, right back. Yeah, and right. If I, if I go to a region that has like a lot of pine trees and I smell that piney smell, that takes me right back. Yeah. I, uh, I think if I knew then what I knew now, I would have spent more time in it, more mm -hmm. time going back into the woods and reading like you do. I know you do. And uh, more time just soaking in the nature because I, I don't know how long we're going to have it. I, I, I cry a little tear every time I see a uh, 
My house here on the hill in Boston used to be surrounded by trees, maple trees, beautiful trees. And one by one, the power companies come in, they take them down. Oh, wrecks our lines. And, you know, take this one. Oh, this one's slightly rotten. We got to take that one away. And they, they plant them with these little dwarf trees that are actually grafted onto dwarf rootstock. So they never grow beyond 12 feet tall. They know what they're mm -hmm. doing. It's just, it's it's evaporating here in the city, and it's mm -hmm. just sort of a matter of time before it evaporates the world over, and hopefully never in the Adirondacks, because forever wild is their motto. I hope but, so. Yeah. But, I think um, the black flies would scare people away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You should be afraid of the black flies. Yeah. I call it soaking God in from the outside in. Yes. And um, one of my Absolutely. mottos is just get outside. And I, I absolutely love doing plant walks with people and just opening their eyes to the wild riches that are all around their feet that they don't even, like Linda used to say, you're walking on your food. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and it's like, people are all of us like, you can see light bulbs going off. It's like, what? I had no idea, you know? And then they feel rich and they feel abundant. And especially if there are times of scarcity in the future, we need to reclaim what used to be common sense. Um, I think you have carried with you as a man, the richness of your childhood memories and of the woods. And um, yeah, you can look back and go, I wish I had been a little more present, but you were there and you had experiences yeah. that children aren't having these days. And so I just want to challenge everyone, get this book, Homestead Memories, and start your own memories and get your children outside and off the damn phone, excuse me. And, you know, just uh, right. make sure you're present and live life because you're only a kid once. And where we're, we were put in a garden, we weren't put in a city. And so we can reclaim that. It just takes some intentionality. One more thing before I let you go. Okay. You talked with me earlier about between the lines, that the secret to foraging isn't necessarily going out to go foraging. It's what? <laughs> this is a really big secret. And I think mom intended it fully, but she never put it in the, in the secret words. This book here, The Wild Food Identification Walks. Well, part of making a walk, and by the way, this one's also got a lot of color. If there it is, yes, and, beautiful. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it's the cheaper color, so we can <laughs> sell this one more reasonably than the other one. But um, she planted these walks there. You see her doing it here. She's bent mm -hmm. over there with her little hunchback, planting the wild foods in between the railroad ties. This and this was, I took this. I made this art from a photograph. Uh, and it looked like this. So she learned wild food cultivation. And to get one or two plants to grow in these takes some art. Uh, but if you plant a whole stand of pigweed, we lamb's quarters, that's what I mean. Pigweed, something else again. But um, in, in one of these squares or just in a section of your yard, it's going to take off. It will propagate. It will live there forever. It'll be happy to have its own space. It'll grow can, like weeds. Right. You can cultivate wild food right under the noses of even hungry people. The hungry hordes visit your house. They're not going to pick your weeds. They're just <laughs> not going to do it. Yeah. But you have a bounty right there. You can pick it fresh. And then at the end of the year, you can wipe it out, dry it, freeze it, whatever have you. And you don't have to traipse all over God's green acre to get the food, you can cultivate it and put it right under your fingertips, right under your nose yeah. and make it in as much of, you know, many people have land, lots of land, but you don't even need a lot of land. One of her first, first, first books, this is the first one I published and I got going, was called A Survival Acre. This is the, the eight and a half by 11 version, comb bound by moi. But, you know, this preceded all the other books and, um, she did it on that acre, that one acre house, the first house she lived in after she got out of the woods. And uh, she found where all the stuff was growing. And then she wrote a tiller strip and get the weeds growing there or just let grow what was there and encourage the ones she wanted and discourage the ones she didn't want. How, how would you weed weeds? I guess you wouldn't do that. But yeah, that's the big secret. You don't have to go everywhere. You can bring them to you. You yes. can grow, grow them right there, and uh, yes. this this book does a lot of 
a lot of the how-to teaching. I, I think honestly, Alinda is the one who influenced me in that because yeah. I have brought a probably, I don't know, 80 different wild edible plants to my acre so that I can have it right here. And I got that from her because she used to do those plant walks where she had it all there. And so it's like, well, I, I want it here. And so I gave two talks last fall called the well, no, the intentional wild food garden. And I did it on two of them. The ones you want close by, the ones you want access to, but never on your land, you know, like the Japanese knotweed and the garlic mustard. And there's quite a few that you really love, but you don't want to have them because they're so invasive on your land. They'll take um, over. Yeah, they'll take over. But then there's some that you just cannot have enough of. And so you want to have them nearby. And so um, she, in her book, this book here is what guided me. And I used this book in teaching those two classes on, on teaching people how to do that. And so I would check out those classes and also get the book, The Plant Identification Walks. Yeah. Mom had a, an apron she used to wear early, early on in her wild food teaching career. It said, if you give an inch, uh, if you give a weed an inch, it'll take a yard. She gave it to me. You've got that? It. Yes. Oh, I'll send yeah. you a picture. Yeah, I have it. I'm so happy you have that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, well, oh, Eric, this has been so much fun. I, I love you. I love Rosary. I love what you're doing. I adored Linda. Um, I still sometimes read all the things she would write to me. And uh, she was such an encouragement to me. She was always cheering me on and um, treated me like I was important to her, which was crazy because there were so many people that were learning from her, not just Holly. So it was like yeah. a real honor to... Um, consider her a precious mentor. And she literally lit a wildfire under me that is raging. And I, my goal is to light as many as I can as well. That's great. Well, you're doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I knew a lot of mom's students over the years, but I would say you're probably her number one protege. <laughs> I really would, even though you did most of the work to carry that yourself. But, uh, you know, she, you, you might have had a little help with I love her. And I also want to recommend if you homeschool to get her homeschool bundle. Yep. Um, I actually helped Rosary with that a little bit because I homeschooled for 30 years. And so I have a few ideas up my sleeve as well. And so I, uh, Rosary reached out to me and I was able to give some of my good ideas that um, I, that would be if I was homeschooling again, I would definitely get that bundle. And um, yeah, that, those, that's those pictures look familiar, Holly. Yeah, those are pictures <laughs> from my kids. <laughs> So, yep. um, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. This is such a blessing, a wild blessing. May God bless you and um, keep soaking God in from the outside in and keep on shining, buddy. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much for having me do this. It was it was great. Okay. Keep up the great work. <laughs> I will. And I'll let you I'll let the winner know who got your you oh. send me cards. Which we will donate, by the way. Yes, they're donated. Thank you, thank you. Um, so those of you that included the questions, oh, and Eric, go go ahead and look at the questions. Don't answer them now. But if there's anything you wanted to answer, you can answer in my group in the comment section. Okay. But honestly, guys, I think most of the questions that you asked could be answered just by getting Linda's books. That's that's really the thing. I, mean, I just the, wanted to the hear your stories. <laughs> yeah. That? I just wanted to hear your stories. And uh, you did a great job of um, helping us feel like we were there and just encouraging us to get our kids and get outside ourselves. And we don't, we never need it to grow old. You're as old as you think. And we are those inner child that's inside of us needs fresh air, needs vitamin D, needs exercise, needs to be in all of creation. So get out there every day and enjoy um, all that's been given for free. You know, I think I'm going to take a few more walks this summer myself. <laughs> As a result of this, right here. Don't forget to give me the link for your uh, magic show. Oh, okay. Yeah, I will send that. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.